Hello and welcome to Pale Reflections, a proud member of the Doof Network where we reflect on Wildbo's most triumvirate work as it releases. I'm Ruben Morehouse. And I'm Elliot Diebold. And we are here to talk about some more of Out of uh, Out of Limbs. Out on a Limb. <laughs> 3.8, 3.9, and security what it's called sunny day logs and some extra yeah. bonus stuff at the end too um i mean we... look this this arc isn't over yet but i hope it doesn't turn into out of limbs that would be <laughs> I, I suppose some people are about to go fight the hungry choir so yeah exactly if you're ever gonna lose limbs it's with the hungry <laughs> choir um before we get into all that though uh just a quick reminder that we're currently running a fan art contest about yes monsters ah spooky and as promised last week, I've come back this so time equipped you, with the um <laughs> the the deadline, which is actually the it's next Friday, Friday the twenty first of August at eleven fifty nine Pacific Standard Time. So, like based on when this is coming out, it's like just under a week left. So yeah, uh, I, I'm assuming if if anyone here operates like me, that means it's it's time to get cracking. Start, the deadline's yeah. coming up. Yep. Uh, so send us your monster fan art, please. Yep. Get out your colored pencils and all that jazz. Um, while you're doing that, we'll get stuck into the episode, shall we? Let's do it. You can so, use our ramblings on the chapters as inspiration, as inspiration for drawing yeah. monsters. Yeah. Um, so our first piece of inspiration is uh, we dive into Adam <laughs> 3.8, and uh, we're in Lucy's perspective. And Lucy and the other Kenneteers are spying on the goblins. Um, it feels like we've been. We haven't done an episode for a long time. I know it's only been a week, but it feels like it's been longer. So I'm just going to recap what's happened, which is that he was kidnapped. <laughs> oh, or, you know, I guess caught isn't the right word. Yeah, caught. Um, and the Kennetiers want to uh, free her. Um, so that's what they're doing. They're spying on the goblins who have Bree tied up, um, and they're going to try and rescue her. Yeah. Um, I, I think what one of the first interesting things I wanted to bring up here is is how the goblins seem to be really set up like in and around all the railway stuff in town mm. um which is just interesting to me because i i didn't question it at all or like because of course like the seedy underbelly stuff is going to be associated with the railway thing mm. um that's just how it how it goes but that also then led me to the thought of like you know, 200 years ago like a, a railway line was sort of seen as like the peak of civilization by a lot of the western world you know like it was it was a sort of sign of industry arriving um, right. i think it was like a very big deal when they started building like really big railway lines in the us and and, and also mm. down here in australia um, mm. as they were sort of being colonized yeah so it, I, I don't know i like i don't know if this ties into the story <laughs> anyway at all but i just thought it was kind of crazy that like it, it only 200 years uh railway stuff has gone from like presumably something that would have made goblins run away in fear as a, as a big part of industry to something where it's, it's kind of where they thrive now and they get to draw you know frog butthole graffiti and stuff i guess it kind of ties into the idea of like technomancers as this group of practitioners who kind of define themselves by something that is very new and very fleeting like railways are a good example of that right because they were you know, the biggest technological invention at one point, right? Like, oh shit, this yeah. is what's going to connect to the world. But now they are, more often than not, you see the, you see kind of abandoned railway stations as like an iconic way of symbolizing, hey, this is something that's fallen by the wayside. Um, yeah, well, and as someone in a small town that, that's struggling in a lot of ways, like they're, they're kind of seen as, as a bit of a symbol of how like places aren't what they used to be. Yeah, that's interesting. So I don't know if there's any, you know, coherent point to be made there, but just something yeah. to reflect on <laughs> on the nature of technology and the nature of goblins, I guess. Yeah, yeah, like those feel like stuff uh the the story's touching on in various ways, especially in these chapters or and, and extra material. Um so yeah, I haven't had any coherent thoughts about how it ties into what the story is actually talking about, but like it seems like a neat sort of side thing at, at the very least. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm with you there. I, I, I mean, I guess speaking of like, uh, you know, s sort of towns and 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 you know, ones that are past their prime or whatever. Lucy sort of opens this with a bit of an internal monologue about um, 
how she, she's kind of pissed off at the powers that be in town because they put all this effort into maintaining like the the center of town and the bits that people see and it feels kind of fake because as soon as you go a few blocks north which most people won't but as soon as you do like it, you can see how bad off the town is mm. um and it sets this really strong tone right at the start of this chapter of like i don't know, wanting to cut through the bullshit or like you yeah. know talking about perception and the way we sort of can dress things up and and you know put on a layer of fakery and, and stuff yeah it felt very no bullshit to me right like yeah lucy kind of drawing this analogy to people who are kind of wallpapering over the problems in their life but instead of that being a personal thing it's the mayor doing it with the town right um, yeah yeah exactly i think it's a metaphor that's used to open up the chapter to sort of get us thinking that way and and because i think it's very it's a very loosey topic like she's yeah. someone who despises bullshit but she like is also someone like you know she, we've talked a lot about like her her whole like dressing routine and how she you know does her hair and everything to make herself like bulletproof and it's yeah she's not necessarily dressing for her she's dressing as a bit of a presentation to some degree and and so there's it, it, it sort of overlaps with both of those aspects of her in a really interesting way. Yeah. I wonder whether we're starting to see notes of something that seems to play into as a theme in some of Wabo's other works without getting sus- sus- specific, you know, the, the, the idea of like towns getting run down and abandoned is something that's a- appeared in at least worm, at least packed. Right. Um, like the idea of a, a town being rebuilt is something that is a, a strong kind of theme in Ward, right? Um, I wonder if we just kind of, I mean, I don't know if it's explicitly something like that or just, you know, Wild Bo being someone who who lives in a fairly rural area in Canada, kind of letting things that he sees about the, the life cycle of, you know, settlements play into his work or whether there is an explicit theme that's starting to come out here. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It'll it'll be interesting to see um where this goes. I think yeah, it, I I don't know, it's hard. Like I feel like the the concept of the small town is is just very common in in mm. stories in general. So mm. like it's uh, I don't know, I find it hard to separate. Maybe as someone who grew up in and and continues to live in um a, a fairly small city, maybe I just sort of see it as the norm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, anyway, so the Kenneteers head towards the, uh, the tool house, uh, that Bree is being kept in. Um, and as they're going, they're kind of talking about how they're going to have to deal with the goblins and the other others that they almost certainly are going to have to confront during this breakout. Yeah. But uh, just planning contingencies for how to deal with everyone in town, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I had this weird reaction to this where it was like, I mean, my first time reading this, I expected it to go a lot worse. Do you know what I mean? Like, obviously, it goes it goes okay. I mean, it doesn't go perfectly, but it goes relatively smoothly, considering that these three, I don't know, don't feel experienced enough to deal with some of the others that they have to deal with. And I guess the reason it goes smoothly is because the only others that they really have to deal with are a few goblins, right? Um, I don't know. I'm just curious whether... There's more at play here. I I don't think there is yet. I'm just, the fact that it just is this thing where it's like, it, it felt like it was a bit too easy for them to pull this off. And I don't, <laughs> I don't have a compelling reason as to why. So my mind is trying to fill in the gaps. I mean, well, there's, there's definitely one big helper they have at the end well, of the yes. chapter that we'll get into. But yes. um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the only ones they really have to actually fight um, are the goblins, which definitely helps. Um. I know what you mean. Like, there's definitely a bit of a sense of uh, I can't remember exactly what the context was, but we we had that whole thing about um, you know, trying to play chess against creatures that have been playing it for a thousand years. Yes, uh, that's sort of what this feels like. Like, they have a lot of power and 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 like a little bit of knowledge, but there's a sense as they go through the list of just like uh, you can't beat all of these people, and even yeah. just taking out the goblins, they basically go through almost all the tricks in their arsenal in this chapter. Yeah. I, That's something they comment on later. I guess uh, putting my finger more firmly on it, what it is is it felt like this was a fine, this thing had finality to the fact that they were making moves against the Kennet others. But really, then then that doesn't seem to be how it plays out. Like, one, not yeah. all of the Kennet others even show up to, to do anything. 
<laughs> and two, as we see in the next chapter, it doesn't seem like it, their fallout from this is actually that big. So I, I guess it just felt Im- more imposing than potentially the Canada will see it as um, in the moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely agree with what you said. Wait, there's a sense of all well, this, like it, it was a bit of a heart wrencher in that they're kind of going through all the others and talking about how to fight them. Yes. In this real way where it, it's funny, like in arcs one and two, I probably would have been like, yes, this is good, smart. Yeah. Um, contingency planning because these things are all scary and dangerous. And now suddenly it's happening and I'm kind of like, Oh, but not like this. Like it's yeah. sad now that they're, they're looking at like John and Matthew and Edith who haven't <sighs> quite done anything like objectively wrong that we know of who, like, they're just sort of having to plan for how can we betray the tools, betray them with the tools they've given us. Mm. It's just kind of sad. Um, yeah. I, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, there, there is definitely this this sense of, like, the, the, the only reason this sort of stuff might work is because they're essentially planning on, like, betraying the trust that they'd been given which is like exactly what the others in town are afraid of but this is exactly (laughs) the situation that the others in town have put them in yeah it's just such a fucking mess it is isn't it um i I really felt this when lucy well this was kind of last chapter but it's kind of you feel it still in this chapter when lucy's thinking about john and how she was thinking about whether he would be a good um a good potential familiar and and that's kind of completely been soured by the these past two chapters right yeah like i think that's that's one of the ones that gets the most time is the idea of oh well if we need to beat john like we can't beat him so what we'll do is we'll like one of us will split off and then use the dog tags to summon him and there's a sense of yeah but he said he won't give us more if we abuse it and that might happen and and not only is this one of the first examples of how quickly they're burning through all their stuff yeah um that they're considering this but yeah like it just feels like that will permanently dent our relationship with him yeah. if we do this like in a very like physical way because we will have one less set of dog tags yeah it, yeah and it's it, they're all kind of things like this where i mean like i think about this with relation to the goblins where they're burning through goblin tricks here, and almost certainly the goblins aren't going to give them any more tricks later, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, the goblins have. I think almost all of them have sort of met their obligations, so I can't see them doing much else. Um, yeah, I mean, there's an interesting part to this, which is uh, like particularly this sort of goblin fairy dyna- uh, dichotomy comes up a bit here, um, where like you know they're going to use the stuff the fairy gave them against the goblins and mm-hmm. the stuff the goblins have given them against the fairy if they show up mm. um a- a- again it's just this cool like versatility that these three have acquired by having been adopted by this you know variety of others mm. um like yeah it's it's i think we'll talk more um in the next chapter about the, the sort of schisms within the others in the town um but there's, you know, this extra layer to this, which is they're using stuff, not just like bouncing back or, or betraying things like with John's dog tags, but, you know, sort of taking something the fairy gave them and using it against the goblins, which is yeah. in some ways an even worse betrayal. Well, it's it's taking the knowledge about what will really get to them and, you know, using it, <laughs> right? Like maximizing the knowledge of that they've gained of how can I fuck with these people? Um, yeah well and in, in, in a way taking advantage of the schisms that exist within the others um or the, the group of others like you yeah. know that they're the fairy and the goblins don't like each other and you're going to kind of use that to hurt the goblins <sighs> yep um, it feels weird to to be against hurting goblins because <laughs> like but they're so delightful that's their thing <laughs> they're just so delightful. yeah but like they probably enjoy it you know well not the not the way they do get hurt in this which is hilarious and we'll, mm. we'll probably get to Mm. yeah um I, th- I think the other thing I, I quickly wanted to talk about it during the, this whole scene um as well, well one thing is just how like hilariously off topic they just keep going mm. um like they almost take turns just sort of like saying okay now we need to get back on topic and then someone else will like take the topic and just go one run wild with it like it was just a really fun moment of like how great these three are as a sort of team um mm that they can't help but be friends even as they're planning to fight everyone. <laughs> um, I hope it's not that. I hope it's not. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, I get what you, I didn't, I didn't like, 
uh, clock that uh, until I saw this in the notes, but um, it could be. I don't, I don't know. I I, I, don't, I think it's just Verona's excitement about um, seeing anyone get into the practice stuff. Yeah, I, but there's just so many moments where they, you know, they're talking about the rest of their friendship and stuff. It's just, it's just a great moment. Yeah. And then they like collaboratively write the poem for Snowdrop's Nettle Wisp, um, which was like a hilarious moment, especially when Lucy comes up with the way to talk to the goblins. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's also yeah that moment. There, there is the one moment where Verona sort of says to Lucy, "Oh, you know, you're so cool when you're into the practice," and. I just noticed in this chapter and the one before it, there were, there were just quite a few moments where I'm just, I'm almost starting to get worried that it feels like Verona is trying to like manipulate Lucy, like giving her these nudges towards the practice, like just yeah, like like I mean, I like at the, on on the one hand, this could just be like a thirteen year old girl who's like excited that her friend is into the same shit as her. Like I totally get that part of it, but. I, I don't know. There's something about the way a few lines have popped up in the last few chapters where I was just like, I'm starting to get a little bit worried that Verona no, is like intentionally pushing Lucy there so that, you know, she can pull off her operation, turn into an other or something. And Lucy will be more behind it because she's deeper in the practice or something. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I feel like it can't be that. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Do you feel Things- that way? Do you feel that way because of the evidence, or you just don't want it to? Be I just true? don't want it to be true. You're yeah, right, okay. <laughs> but it, it feels too manipulative for Verona, right? She's not that manipulative, is she? Well, I mean, you know, she, she's her dad's daughter. Yeah. Um. Well, gosh, that's horrible. Um. <laughs> anywho, so the the plan is, um, the plan is for Snowdrop to go in and distract them, uh, while the Ken and others kind of eavesdrop and then. Sneak in and, and bust Brie out. Um, and that's more or less what happens. It, 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 Snowdrop <laughs> enters, starts distracting, and the Kenneteers, you know, get get in there and start uh, start getting rid of Brie. Or not getting rid of Brie, getting her out of there. Yeah. And I mean, like, it, it's fun how this this turns into a real fucking heist. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, Verona, Verona does this big rune and... And then, st- like, it, it ends up being a rune that is designed to, like, cut a circle out of glass, which is obviously, like, I mean, you can't have a heist without cutting a circle in glass. That's just the rules. Um, it, it's very fun. Like, I, I was giggling like an idiot when I read that part. Mm. Yeah. Um, there was this... <laughs> yeah, it's good, isn't it? There's this bit that, that was, like... 100% felt like it was one of those quick cut montages that you would see when people are off to a heist where there's these lines where it's like masks on, hats on, coats on. And I feel like I'm seeing these like rapid cuts. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. Like there's a cut and someone slips a glove on and there's a cut and somebody's yeah, like pulling exactly. up like a jacket or something. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's like one I, I totally or two second long montage. That's a handful <laughs> of shots that just like gets you in the zone for, oh, they're, they're in heist mode now, right? Well, and then, and then, because it has to finish on a shot of all of them fully in costume. Oh, yeah, like in cool poses. 100%. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, that's going to be the you know the pale adaptation, I guess. <laughs> well, because I assume that sort of thing even works in comics, right? Because you could just have a couple of panels that are basically those close shots, mm. and then the big panel of, of all mm. of them in a group. Yeah. So even okay. if it's a visual adaptation, that's that's like just a a, a comic, it could mm. still work. Mm. Um, I, I, yeah. I think the other great thing from this sort of section where they're eavesdropping is um, there's a bit where Snowdrop goes in because <laughs> Snowdrop is the distraction uh, in the heist and um, there's sort of a clattering as, as Snowdrop, I don't know, does something. I can't even remember something ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> like Ch- Cherry sort of turns to Bray and goes, she's dumber than I am. And that's saying something. <laughs> and Bray just answers with, I see. And I don't really have anything to say about this other than I just I just love Cherry Pop so much. Ah, Cherry Pop is good. Um, but th- there's there's a bunch of there's actually a bunch of good moments about how like Cherry's still just the only one who doesn't get Snowdrop's thing. Uh, like, there's a bit where Toad Toad Swallow is like, "You got to tell me," and she's like, "I will tell you." And to- uh, uh, yeah, she's like, "I will tell you," and like everyone grumbles, and it's like, "I." Or I will not tell you, and it's like just Toad Swallow and Cherry Crumble because Cherry's just not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, great. I, I was going to pull out something left in our pale predictor sheet, but I saw you've already 
Got it. So we'll yeah, talk about yeah. that later. A, a primo cherry pop theory. <laughs> Um, so yes, Toad Swallow arrives and things start to pop off. Um, Snowdrop gets grabbed and this kind of nettle wisp bomb goes off uh, with with ponies and sparkles everywhere. <laughs> um, yeah, it's such a such a hilarious thing. The like My Little Pony nettle wisp to to hurt the goblins. Mm. Um, I so to- Toad Swallow as he arrives, he's singing this this song, and I, and I googled it, and it's it's a ballad. It's usually called Matty Groves, but like you know, ballads that are like five hundred years old, like this, they they have various names because the the names change as as it evolved. Mm. Um, but it's basically this this song about a young man who hooks up with the wife of a lord, and then the lord comes back and catches them and kills them for it, or. I mean, it's one of those things, like, again, the story of Voldemort, like, sometimes he kills the wife and finds his unborn son in falls out of her when he kills her, or um, oh, there were some other ones. That was the most horrifying alternate ending um, <laughs> that I came across. But, um, I mean, do you have any theories as to if there's any symbolism behind this song choice? I mean, obviously the fact that our protagonists are too young for that to be a plot point rules a lot of stuff out. Um <laughs> if the characters characters that have gotten murdered or had horrible consequences, I mean, like theoretically, maybe Charles pissed off Alexander by sleeping with the wrong person, or the or the Carmine Beast slept with somebody and got murdered for it. I, I don't know. I mean, like it doesn't really make any sense, does it? I was gonna say, I, that what if it's yeah? Oh, so I was gonna say, what if it's like a like just a different type of betrayal of trust, right? Like it doesn't have to be sleeping with someone, but like what do you, you know, yeah. like. I mean, jumping ahead a bit, like Edith going behind Matthew's back to Mm. to do shenanigans, you know, like Mm. something something like that. Yeah, yeah, um, could be. Um, Yeah, my my gut feeling was going to be, oh no, I I just think you're reading too much into it. But we actually get validated later that um, you should be reading a lot into these things because they are probably going to be important (laughs) because we get one that does seem to be important later. So you know. I'm happy for you to pull out weird theories. Uh, yeah, I think, it'll, I think it'll work. I just I, like I, something. So you see in these Wabo stories is, is, is he chucks things like this in, but I don't think they're ever just the one thing. Like they'll tie mm. in, and it might not be in a super substantial way, but I feel like there's usually some reason for a specific thing to happen. Um, yeah, which is why I tend to grapple onto things like this in the homework. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, there's there's a lot of bits like this where innocuous looking things are actually foreshadowing or metaphor for other things later. That's why it's so fun. Yeah, like That's why it works on reread. Yeah, exactly. Too. But it's it's never just like a random song. Like it's usually at least thematically relevant to something in some way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah, you're right. There's usually multiple bits going on. But I have no idea what the bits are for this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, me either. I mean, yeah, that, uh, I think we talked about this in Deep in Ward, but um, I love how Wobbo stories have so many threads going on. It's like the the truth is always a needle buried in a haystack. Mm. And in retrospect, it's always so obvious where it was, but you you don't usually see it as it's happening. It's so much fun. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll see, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry. Back to this chapter. Yeah. Um, uh, I do just uh, love uh, the I, the ballad that we hear with, like the fact that yeah. Totally, we get to hear him swear because he doesn't realize there are people around. It's so fun <laughs> to me. Yeah, seeing seeing the real Toad Swallow. Um, yeah, especially because uh, the, I looked up the real versions of this song, and he he actually embellishes the lyrics a fair bit. It's not that crude. Um, usually he's he's sort of dirtying it up. Yeah, classic. Probably, I don't know. Actually, there's there's been a lot of forms of it. Maybe the 17th century. That's just how gruesome it was. I don't Maybe know. Maybe Toad invented this song and has just perpetuated it throughout the centuries. <laughs> I, do we know how old the goblins are? I think we've asked that question before. Actually, yeah, I have no idea. Are they? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Are they immortal? I don't think so. Toad Swallow being 400 years old would go against my. He's some new type of goblin theory. Or oh, maybe I guess they said goblins kind of shackle off um like labels and stuff, so maybe they change. Mm. Anyway, sorry, yeah, back to the chapter. Um 
there's this great moment where as they're trying to rescue Bray amongst the, the pink cloud of um, happiness, uh, where like Bray is doing that thing that people always try to do when they're being rescued with, like, you know, no, I've got to grab my hat. Um, and what I loved about this is usually that pisses me off in, in most things. I'm like, no, just leave your junk and get out of there. And this is like <laughs> the one time where I was like, we just had a whole bonus bit on all the cool shit she had. And I was like, yeah, we've got to get all this, this shit. It's so cool. Yeah. Please don't leave it behind. Yeah, no. And when we find out that they're going to keep all the cool tricks at the end of the chapter, I was like, yes, this yeah, is what same, I live for. Same. Yeah. Um, anyway. I mean, there's probably some symbolism to that just while we're talking about it. Like, they used up all of their tricks with the can at others, but they 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 did it and they made new friends and now they're getting tricks from them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll, we'll talk about that later, I guess. Um, so okay. yeah, Bri- they rescue Bree. The Kennedys try and make a run for it, but, uh, Toad Swallow and the goblins give chase and um yeah we get we get some hastily delivered exposition as they're running <laughs> yeah i mean Bree sort of goes on this whole thing about like how you know how much the choir didn't fix her problems and they talk about it a bit more later in the chapter too but i'll just group it all like to talk about it here but um i mean <laughs> there's really just you can't help but feel like there's no hope in this world a little bit, right? Because it's like even something like the Hungry Choir, um, it has like it's uh, somehow made her life worse than when she was literally poisoning herself. Mm. Like she's like, oh no, this isn't better than when I was eating batteries. <laughs> it's like okay, so <laughs> what? Um, yeah, it's pretty rough. I mean, no character exists in this world without a rough backstory, right? Yeah, yeah, true, true. I mean, I just love how this connects to, like, the the whole idea of, like, I think we originally sort of talked about The Hungry Choir as this, like, you know, get, one of those, like, game shows, like American Idol or something, mm-hmm. and how they're, they're like, get, get rich quick schemes, basically, that take advantage of the people. And I sort of feel like that, like, like Brie talks about how it reminds me of people who talk about winning the lottery, like, and how it can actually make their lives worse because, you know, suddenly they're targeted by all these extra people. Um, they can't really connect with their other life because it completely changes all all their connections to their people. Like you know, if 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 all your friends know that suddenly you've you've earned thirty million dollars, they are just probably going to treat you a bit differently. Um, it, yeah, like I, I don't know. Like I just I just really like how it sort of connects. Like it, it makes sense to me, but I'm just at the same time I'm like, so what's the point <laughs> of, of anything in this world? Mm. It, it just all seems to make things worse. Um, you know, I think Lucy sort of even compares it to a bit. There's a bit where, um, when the gremlins get bounced back, and um, Bree is like, "Oh, he didn't tell me about that." And Lucy sort of connects it to the amount of time she said the same sort of thing, and she's like, "Yeah, you shouldn't be in this world, right?" Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's just, I mean, that's the sad thing, and that's the thing that makes this so unnerving constantly is. It always seems like, oh, this is the next, this is the solution to my problem. But then you get to that solution and you realize, oh, shit, this has its own whole suite of problems, right? There's no answers to anything in, in, um, in this universe. It's, it's temporary solutions that bring their own problems that you now have to worry about. Yeah, or it's, a, it's, it's the get-rich-quick schemes that don't work, right? Like things, yes, something like the exactly. Hungry Choir. Um, and these things are designed to prey on on people. Like, I I feel bad saying this, but so so Bree's plan is she wants to keep the ritual going, and part of the reason they have to do that is because she needs to keep getting the benefits. Yes. The side effect of that is the hungry choir will still occasionally continue to get new people to keep it at its power level. She knows as a winner that it's actually made her life worse, and. Uh, this this Pika thing that she suffered from sounds like pretty fucking bad and like one of the best reasons you could sign up for the choir. So I'm just sort of looking at it and I'm going, at what point do you ask Brie if it's okay to just sacrifice her life to get rid of the choir completely? <sighs> like, I I feel terrible saying it, but you you know, like I think she like at what point does she need to look at the bigger picture and just sort of give up to to save other people? I'm not, I'm not saying she should be expected to do that, but um, I would think a good person would give it serious thought in her circumstance. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I agree, but no one's ever going to... It's hard to make that call for yourself, right? Of like, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll just 
die. And that's that's the <laughs> price I want to pay, right? I don't know. I feel like if she hadn't met Zed, um, she might be more willing to. But the fact that she's sort of found someone to fall in love with has probably yes. helped. I mean, she has um, more to live for, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, also, side note, but the, the Kennedys here sort of talk about, and they seem to think that, like, the original intelligence of Yolda might actually be a part of the Hungry Choir. Like, it wasn't yeah. just the power. They they specifically sort of allude to the fact that they think Yolda as an individual might exist somewhere in the chaos, which was a a, a specific point I hadn't noticed. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's I don't know. I mean, we've seen it be intelligent before, right? We we saw things like when it yeah. almost tricked Avery into signing up, which was a t- a total. And at the time, I think we even <laughs> said, "Hey, this seems like it's too smart for what we know of the Hungry Choir," and this is. Presumably the reason behind that is there is some sentience behind it that is more than a traditional incarnate ritual or whatever would have. Um, I mean, yeah, but, but even then I, I might not have thought it was enough Yolda to really be worth mentioning as, as yeah, part of her. Yeah. It, I, I guess it's just what this made me think as well is something I, I'd been assuming um, since we learned it was Yolda was that like it had the, the Hungry Choir had been created um whereas like like if it is yolda sort of at the core of this that actually leaves room for it just to be something she may be morphed into or or like less of a like you you know zed talks about using her for parts right Mm. um i i see it as less of that it could be it could be like that that's what i'd been assuming had already happened to form the hungry choir whereas now i think maybe it could be somewhere more in the middle or just be totally natural but like like is this Yolda's response to being killed? Like it's it's just like we don't know in, yeah. anything about her personality. But I was even thinking this might be the closest she can get to helping people, like Bree, right? Like she's is this is this actually Yolda's attempt to shape herself into someone who actually can help people? Mm. Yeah, interesting. It, it, I could see it being either like her regaining some positivity or her manifesting some negativity depending on her personality we we really don't know enough to know if she's trying to be better than she is or if she's slipping into being mm. worse than she is you know yeah 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 exactly um yeah who knows i mean we're gonna <laughs> i don't know i'm we're getting the feeling i'm getting the feeling for sure that things are coming to a head with hungry choir and carmine beast and it's all kind of coming together um yeah so i'm sure funny. we'll like find a- out soon about a week ago, we were we were just talking on Facebook, and we were so we sort of agree that we thought we were maybe about to hit the halfway point in the story. Yeah. Uh, after reading three point nine, I think maybe we could be even a bit further than that. Yeah, I feel like we're maybe three quarters of the way through, if not more. Um, yeah. Now, which is weird that these chapters have just made us feel like we're so much further than we are. You know what it is? I feel like the fact that we've finally spoken to Louise. We'll talk. Yeah. About that, the fact that we've finally spoken to Louise feels like it's marking the beginning of the end to me. Well, it wasn't just that we spoke to Louise. It was a lot of stuff came out of it. Well, yes, true. And, um, and it, it felt like, useful. okay, <laughs> yeah, we're narrowing in. Yes. Um, but, yeah. Uh, so, speaking of, um, we also should talk about this moment. Uh, so, just to take everyone back, we're still running along the, the railway tracks um, away from the goblins. And uh, Toad Slaughter tries to call in reinforcements. And uh, he, you know, he calls John. Uh, he even calls Guillaume. And he does get stopped from uh, calling in Marisica, um, mm. which is definitely this moment because the fact that like a goblin is calling the fairy because we know how much these two groups hate each other, it, it's already like a big deal that he was willing to call them. Um, but then that that kind of gets overshadowed by this this uh, detail blunt munch let's slip that uh, it's to do with the way the votes went, why they're particularly mad at Marisica yeah. right now, which is crazy. Like the I'm, I was really confused about this because obviously we we see Guillaume is on Team Kennetier later, right? Like, so yeah. are both the Fae just like on their team? But the other thing is, okay, here's the other point: is we get that beat next chapter where they touch on how they went and visited the cave, the Fae cave, and there was this weird kind of like frosty vibe with Marisica. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now I'm like, well, wait, but 
from that, it sounds like Mushika isn't on their team. So I really just have no idea what to make of it, unless the goblin, unless this is like a, a big double bluff and they don't want to call Marisica because she's actually, you know, the people that they call are the ones that are actually pro Kenneteer and not anti Kenneteer for some reason. Yeah, or, or you know, it, it could be Marisica and Guillaume putting up appearances by keeping the distance from them. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Um, but who do they the call him, right? They call Matthew, they call John, they call Guillaume, right? Do they call Edith? I can't remember, but at least Matthew yeah. and Guillaume on Team Kenneteer, right? Pretty pretty firmly from what we see in this chapter and next chapter. John, yeah. you can kind of see him going either way, but I can see him being on their team. So weirdly, the goblins call what seem like the most positive, uh, but I guess they don't have that many choices. Who else would they fucking call? I don't know. But also, if they were calling the, pos- like, the positive people, that would imply they're probably on that too, and there weren't enough positive votes for that to be the case. Yeah. So, like, it's, like in that case, you'd actually want Marisica if she voted the same as you. So, it, it in my mind, I'm, I'm assuming this has to be about the vote on whether or not to teach bindings. Right. And that means I also sort of have to assume that Marisica voted yes. Mm. Um, and then theoretically also, that means Matthew, John, and whoever else didn't vote. Yeah, at least one of them didn't. But it, it mm. definitely adds, like, I don't know, a fucking fairy, man. Um, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> who, know, who knows with them? It's just like, I feel like half the time I bring up fairy-isms, and it's just like, so this tells us this about the fairy. Don't know how that fits into yeah, the greater that, context. We'll have to wait yeah, until they exactly. do. <laughs> Ah, uh, yikes. Um, um, yeah, there's just too many layers going on here to really know what's going on. Yeah. Um, it, we should also, like, give credit. This is a very, like, intense action scene. Like, I was on the edge of my seat, um, especially because I kept having to remind myself during the fight that no one can actually really hurt anyone else. Mm. Um, like, Bree is actually the only person who's really injurable in this entire situation. Um or, or, you know, she can also do the injuring, I suppose. Um, but it's like it simultaneously highlighted to me how bullshit the idea of, like, this, these peace deals are because you could still basically be actively in combat and just not taking kill shots and it kind of counts. Um, but it creates a really different and, like, fun kind of tension as well where there's, like, this chase scene, but, you know, everyone is holding back a bit and focusing on, like you know, tripping you up rather yeah. than, like, taking you out. <laughs> the goblins are perfect for it as well because it does feel a bit slapstick, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a very fun vibe. Um, also, also, just, just before we move on from this section, I do need to highlight there's a moment where Verona turns into a fucking bird for a second <laughs> to jump over the, the tar stuff. Um, it's just, she's such a ledge. Um... I, I actually, no, and there's also the bit where Brie bites into a goblin, which, like, what, <laughs> That's Brie, my what? favourite bit, where, <laughs> where Brie weaponizes her eating disorder, basically, is what is happening here. Um, well, so at this point, it's more of an eating power. Yeah, I guess. But, yeah, <laughs> I, like, it's just because, <laughs> like, what a terrible enemy to decide to try and use it against. They're, like, the <laughs> grossest thing ever. Yes. Um, God, yeah, you really wouldn't want to eat a goblin, but that's life. Um, yeah, so, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, they, 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 there's this uh, slapstick fighting sequence, they're running away, and the group makes it to the train station, and we get a, bit, a brief rest as they've summoned the, um, the regular show ghost to fight some goblins. Uh, before Bree uses the sticky keyboard uh, to uh, release some gremlins. Yeah. I, it's, wait, because we don't know. Wait, what's the difference between a gremlin and a goblin? It's, it seems like there is one. I think but it's they also just seem... to do with feeding them after midnight is the only difference, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, because like Blunt Munch obviously kind of takes over them. So is it just different nomenclature, or is there some sort of technical difference between a gremlin and a goblin? Yeah, I don't know. There must be some um, some difference, like, uh, but who knows? Yeah, I mean, they're clearly related enough, like that. Blunt Munch could control them, so yeah, exactly. they're, they're similar. There's clearly something but, um, there. Yeah. Um. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I guess should we touch on the fact that we've we've already talked about this a bit, but the just the idea that there's they're really just like using up all their tricks here, right? Like they they've just yeah. completely burned through. Basically every 
well, not everything. The the hot lead they've burned through, they've burned through a lot of goblin tricks. Um, the nettle wisp, uh, they haven't used up the dog tags, but yeah, they they, they chew through like a good chunk of glamour. Um, it, it's like yeah, a lot of the stuff like Verona loses ten hours worth of drawing. Um, yeah, I mean they no. burn through a lot for you know just getting Bree out of here and, and not actually going up against. Not, or not taking much from anyone else, you know? Like, it just costs them a lot to mm. get Bree out. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Just using up their bag of tricks. I guess they get Technomancer tricks after this, but I, I doesn't feel like that's... I feel like, it does feel like that's a downgrade, right? Yeah, I mean, in, in part because, like, I, I feel like a big part of their strength has just been this diversity of stuff they've had. Mm. Um, like, they've had so many different tools, and they're kind of losing a, a bit of a part of that. I mean, you had they had to use them eventually, I suppose, but yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So good times. Um, so they 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 more or less get away uh, before they run into the big bad of the chapter, Gilame, uh, and immediately <laughs> the tone shifts to being like, "Oh shit, this is actually a threat now," <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I I, I love this because Gilame shows up and. Yeah. I was immediately like, oh, oh shit. Uh, okay, yeah. like, yeah, this the shit's real now. Um, and then he basically challenges Lucy to 1v1 <laughs> in IRL. Um, and then it, it's like the fear didn't go away, but excitement got added to it. And I think that's what I love about the fairy is how they make me feel simultaneously terrified. It's like the part of me that is empathizing and and putting myself in the story, like immersing myself, is terrified. But the part of me that is just like reading the story and, and mm. appreciating it, appreciating it, like as a separate thing, is is just as excited. And it's, it's just a weird conflict of emotions. And I just <laughs> just like the the whole time it was going on, I was like hating myself because Gilmo sets it up, and I, I was like, this sounds achievable. She could make him bleed a little bit, and, and wait. The other part of me is like, Elliot, you know that she can't. Yeah, you know course. he wouldn't do this if, if yeah. she can. The, the <laughs> fact that Guillaume sets up this challenge implicitly means that he can't. <laughs> like, she just has no chance. Yeah, uh, but there was a part of me like, oh, maybe she'll surprise him. She'll be quicker than he thinks. It's just oh, like, no, maybe. she won't. Yeah. But, That's um, it's gonna work. like, I just, I just love fairies. <laughs> like, this is like, it's so stupid and theatrical. And you got all the goblins off on the side. And, like, you got Todd Sawyer's like, this is fucking stupid. Can you just grab her? And he's like, no, I must mm. fight her. It must be fair. <laughs> I love it. Ah. <sighs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, this this is a great sequence, right? It's very elaborate. Mm. It's this weird challenge. It's very fairy. Um, and then obviously we find out it's a, a fake. Um, mm. But uh, as we, I don't know. There's just a lot to read into with this tool, right? Like, so <laughs> the thing that really got to me about it was when Gilame turns into like young Gilame form, um, sexy distraction Gilame. Yes, exactly. The amount of times that Lucy comments on how attractive young Gilame is is so worrying to me and it makes me feel like that plus the fact that he's clearly like being very buddy buddy with them and has been this entire story makes me feel like he's trying to become a familiar to one of them for some reason. Um I was actually just as you started that I was having the thought. I was like, well, now that John's out of the picture for Lucy's right? familiar. Yeah. Um I don't know, but I, I, again, I don't think we know enough about that to know what the motivation is there, but it just, he's just creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, especially because it's, like, it's so obvious, even in Lucy's head, like, he's just fucking toying with her for the whole fight. Like, it, it, he he's basically dancing and she's trying to fight. <laughs> it's got how it felt to me. It reminded yeah. me of um, it, it reminded me of like some of the Avatar: The Last Airbender bits where like Aang will just like you know zip around people and like dodge their attacks. Mm. Like Gilbe, just it, in my head, he was just moving so fluidly that it's just like not even close at all. He's just he feels like he's just toying with her, right? Like there's no, yeah, yeah. It, he's never in any slight danger. No, I don't. I don't think he was. Yeah. Um, also, because he's a good showman, uh, he monologues a bunch because he gets asked some little questions and he answers them <laughs> absurdly thoroughly. Um, 
and, and we got to talk about this because it's, it's really juicy stuff. Like he talks about why he's in Kennet, um, which is basically that uh he decided for a kick that he wanted to feel the deepest love possible so he found this guy fell in love with him it sounds like it was maybe a human guy um it's it's not actually said but that was the impression i got but anyway they basically both glamoured up their hearts so that the love they were feeling was like the as deep as it sort of possibly can be um and in just this sort of ultimate example of the fairy condition, uh, spent a whole lifetime with him and now is like exiled himself in mourning, um, which is also very dramatic. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, like, but just this whole story is insane. Like who, <laughs> who's like, I need to feel the deepest love. And so I'm going to find someone I love artificially increase it. Um, and then like, I don't know, go, go live in a weird, podunk town for a couple of years after the fact what's your read on this elliot what's your read on this backstory i mean insane <laughs> like, like um I, I mean you know he can't lie so he, he sort of must be telling the truth but like yeah i don't know like i don't i don't know <laughs> the fairies man <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know you can never you feel like you can never take them at their word right yeah, I, I'm kind of willing to just take this up front. I feel like Guillaume is just really interesting. Like, Marisica, I, I feel like whenever she says something, there's some hidden meaning or something. Like, she's a trickster. Whereas Guillaume is this, like, the the sort of recurring beat has been, um, like, oh, what, what do they sort of say? It's, like, more subtle, but, like, mm. also more direct. Mm. Um, so like, I, I, I think he's genuine here. I don't know how genuine the morning is or whether he just feels that it's part of the process, mm. like part of the show. Um, I, I guess it comes down to how much fairies can feel actual love and all that, but like, he doesn't really seem like someone who's mourning at this point. Cause he's fucking around with all this bullshit. Um, yeah, it's, he's, he hasn't been very somber, has he? Like, no, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, he's been rather the opposite, honestly. Um, so I, I don't know how I feel about the the morning specifically, but I'm inclined to believe that he believes the rest of it. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, th- then there's this bit about the love letter, which seemed a little odd to me. Like, what's the power that that has? Is that really worth Marisica giving up many, many years of her life to go after? I mean, I don't know, maybe for fairy it's worth it, but... Yeah, it's an interesting little wrinkle of, of stuff. Because um, basically, I guess, like, if I'm... If I'm at all right that it was like a, a human who who passed away that the Gilmay was in love with, mm. why would some human person's letter matter to the fairy courts? Because it sounds like this is well, like a, a small piece that would help the courts just completely fall apart, um, which sounds like a really fucking big deal. Um, mm. So yeah, like it's 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 very curious. Um, I. Yeah, I don't know. Like maybe Gilhame is is a prince or something, and he's important, and that's where the letter comes in. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Who knows? I don't know. Is it? It's hard to know if it's just like fairy are so starved for things to do that that's enough to to spend years of your life on, <laughs> or if there's some <laughs> deeper meaning to this love letter. Um, we still do have some suspicious Gilhame bits and pieces, right? Like the fact that he. Yeah. Went off to have a strange, curious meeting with somebody that you won't tell anyone about. Um, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Who knows? Uh, I mean, you know, that could be out of the bounds of, of any of the stuff we really have to worry about. As he says, it's like your great grandchildren could have died of all that age by the time these things actually happen. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's hard to know what's relevant with the Fae, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They've got so many schemes going on. Um, I, I mean, I think the other thing here is like this idea that the courts can go through these upheavals like mm. Guillaume seems to apply it's such a fundamental thing they'd actually lose this like seasons motif that they've got mm. right now um which is like i, I don't know we, we heard in arc two about how the spirit world was becoming a bit different when they went there um we're obviously dealing with technomancers a lot now and the sort of cutting edge uh stuff relating to magic and meaning um I wonder if I wonder if that's related at all. Like it, you know, that, that's come cropping up. I think a bit more as a, a theme of things like how the world is is changing, and you know, I think that ties into this other stuff we've talked about with like justice and um, you know, e- equality being mm. themes of the story. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Um, 
So, yeah, uh, Lucy loses this duel. Or we get to this point where Guillaume is kind of saying to Lucy, okay, now just give up. And Lucy's kind of like, what? But when she finally does, we find out uh, this was all just a big ruse and the, the others have completely escaped. <laughs> like from some fucking Looney Tunes cartoon, um, the, there's this <laughs> smoky afterimage of where they were, but they've just dashed off, <laughs> is what it felt like to me, at least. Um, oh, yeah. I, and what's, we all, this was all Verona. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think the best thing about this, like, this twist that Guillaume was in on it, is... Um, and this was only obvious to me on my second read through. There's a bit where, like, as it's starting, um, and he's like walking towards Lucy to begin the fight, he sort of turns to the goblins and he's like, You need to watch the rest of them. And in retrospect, that's so obviously him like counting on the contrary na- nature of goblins to then stop watching them. Mm. <laughs> um, it's also great, like, plausible deniability. He can be like, I told them to watch them. Mm. This isn't on me. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's classic fey goblin like spat, and I I get the sense that Guillaume part of the reason Guillaume did this was just to get one over on the goblins, right? Like <laughs> just to be like, yeah, fuck you. I don't want to begin theorizing on what his motivations could be. Um, it, I just love how, like, again, like just walk on the ferry, like the fact that Guillaume is seemingly on the side with them didn't make me feel any better. Like it sort of happens, and I'm like. Somehow the fact that he's on side makes me more worried than if he was against them. Mm. Yeah, interesting. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm I'm pro Guillaume after this. <laughs> I, I've always been suspicious because of the fairy. That it just feels like there's so many horrible things that can go wrong. But I don't know. He's he's uh, been elevated here. I mean, I'm very pro Guillaume in the sense that I want to see more of him in the story. Um. But, like, I also don't want him to interact with any of the characters in the story. Mm. If that makes sense. I worry every time he's on there, but I also like, can't get enough of him. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, I'm i going to be so sad when, when he does some horrifically evil thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but if Marissica's involved in all this Carmine Beast bullshit, Mm. Wouldn't it be funny if that's all just a distraction to get this note? <laughs> like <laughs> the whole Carmen Beast thing has just been to get this yeah. fucking love letter, and then the story ends with her getting it, and then just fucking you know putting it on her blog and making fun of Guillaume or some nonsensical yeah, shit. Like, Guillaume actually is on the Kenneteer side, and he has been, and Marissa knew that would happen. This whole thing has been designed <laughs> to put him in a situation where she can get the note. Ah, <laughs> oh, I hope that's it. I hope that's it. <laughs> do I? No, I do. <laughs> um, um, anyway, yeah. so, yeah, so Lucy catches up to the others. They've kind of been dealing with Zed, um, or as we call him, Zed. Uh, and so... Wait, we do? What? Yeah, that's how it's pronounced. Z. It's, okay. it's not Zed, it's Z. Oh, okay, sorry, I get it. Okay, no, yeah. I just got that. Anyway. Um. Anyway. I mean, he's Canadian, it's Zed. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, Zed has agreed to leave Kenneth alone in exchange for some hints with, with THC and uh, getting Bree back, I guess. Yeah. And, like, I mean, uh, uh, Matthew touches on this next chapter, but, like, my response to, to seeing that this was the deal was, like, doesn't this seem like exactly the kind of shit that Kenneth others would be on board with? Like, maybe aside from the stabbing the hungry choir in the back thing, there are obviously people who don't agree with that. But, like, I was kind of like... Okay, I feel like these relationships are going to be salvageable now because a big part of the end results of this whole bullshit is that Zed has now promised to leave the town alone, which is the exactly the stopgap measures that um, all the Kenneth others are so keen on. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <sighs> I think it's good. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm like, you know, we the external practitioners were set up as this big threat, right? Like... Yeah. It was set up as the th- the whole reason for everything that's happening in Kenneth with with the trio, right? Um, is to protect yeah. Kenneth from external practitioners. Is this fine? Is this has this always been fine? And they're just too nervous. I don't know. Maybe Zed is just a good example, and Alex is, was a bad example. So maybe I'm maybe that's incorrect. 
Yeah, I mean, we'll see, but it certainly seems like the people on top are the scariest and the worst, which is probably a very important part of it all. Um, well, let's let's get there when we get there in the in yeah. the extra material. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, they they get the. I mean, they call it junk, which is offensive. Lucy calls it junk. It's <laughs> clearly great. Uh, they they get a, they get all the cool technomancer tricks. Um, I mean, everybody loves a sticky keyboard, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the first thing I do whenever I uh, install a new version of Windows is turn off sticky keys. So, no, <laughs> the answer. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> what a specific, stupid reference. <laughs> uh, anyway, so then this chapter ends with uh, with Lucy heading back into Kennet and, and kind of worrying about the aftermath of what they've just done. Um, and that's more or yeah. less where we pick up next chapter. Yeah, um, it sort of jumps ahead. Uh to the the next day and we jump into Avery's head. Yep. Um Avery is at the shops with her family or specifically with her mother and with Carrie and Carrie's friend and with Declan and two, Declan and Declan 2 and 3. Declan and the Declans. Yeah. Which is their band that they also are in. <laughs> um anyway, yeah. So just a fun shopping trip. Yeah, I I mean the the chapter basically opens with like Avery disassociating uh in the middle of this shop and she has this moment that like i feel like we can all relate to like there's that little idea of uh, when you're a bit off kilter or, or something like you you just notice something about somewhere you go all the time like you'll just you'll just notice something like at the front of your house or something and it's like i've never really paid attention to you know the 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 branch of this tree mm. that's so weird um and I, I sort of like really connected to that. And then it sort of goes on and, and Avery sort of talks more about like all the smells of things and how it's affecting her. And I sort of realized, oh, this isn't like she's just having a bit of an off kilter, noticing different details moment. She's just like straight up like dealing with trauma mm. uh, and kind of like zoning out. Um, her mom sort of has to call her back into reality. Um, <laughs> yes. It, it really, it, it sets the tone for this chapter of like, Oh boy. Yeah, what is going on with Avery, right? Like it's I don't know what it is. We get a few hints this chapter that things just aren't okay for Avery right now. She's really there's just some stuff going on that indicates she's really not in a good place. I guess it's just kind of this hasn't been this has been the case since the 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 forest, forest Ruben trail, but I don't know. It just really comes comes out this chapter. I mean, it's arguably been a problem since before the story even started, yeah, um, to some degree. But uh, yeah, she's she's sort of. I mean, look, she's she's a high functioning glamour addict at this point. That's something that really came came to the fore in this chapter. Like she's using glamour, mm. um, to to. I mean, she's using it like cocaine or something, basically, she, to to sort she of uses it to change her just to like fix up her hair, like for very minor uses. Yeah well like it's it's really i don't know it, it's really just she's she she you say you joke about it being like cocaine but it does feel like she's just kind of formed a dependency on it yeah no no i'm, I'm not really joking at all like it's mm. it's you know whenever she sort of has this good moment like she's using it as a pick-me-up like it's it's absolutely a dependency um and you know that can only go well uh he, yeah i i mean yeah, I, I guess we'll see where it goes, but the, I definitely was like looking at all the glamour use this chapter and just going like, this is just not healthy. And and like she's made strides forward. Like the the first ribbon trail did do some cool stuff for her, but she's she's trying to almost treat it like, and now I'm fixed and I'm good. Mm. Um, and and sort of using the glamour to help try and make that the truth. Um, there's a bit particularly later in this chapter that I think I want to talk about where we see that that's just not the case like you know she's she's better but in in some ways she's almost more traumatized and um you know she's not like fixed mm. yeah um 100 percent. uh but can we give props to avery's mum for really putting her finger right on that yeah yeah avery's mum kills it this chapter I, yeah i know we've we've sort of like on avery's parents in the past it's sort of been like oh they seem like they're trying but sometimes they just get too distracted or like mm. you know they clearly drop the ball when she had the, the isolation stuff before the story started mm. like they, they clearly don't have a perfect track record but like avery's mom i think does a stellar job at mumming 
uh, this chapter. Yeah, of all the parents in the lives of the Kennet trio, um, Avery's mum really has been the only one to put a put the nail, you know, hit the nail exactly on the head in terms of being like, "Hey, I know it seems like everything's kind of fine with you, Avery, but I just have this horrible suspicion that something terrible is happening with you." Is anything like yeah. that going on? And Avery's like, oh, no. But obviously, <laughs> like, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, I mean, it's also the thing where she's like, I'm worried about the thoughts that are in your head. And Avery's like, you don't want to worry about the thoughts that are in my head. Even I don't want to worry about the thoughts that are in my head. <laughs> yeah. and it's like, so Avery, she's take right. A, take a beat, man. <laughs> like, God. <laughs> um yeah yeah um especially and again right there's another bit with the stuff with verona's dad later um i, w- I want to talk about as well just like mm-hmm. how well um avery's mom i think r- reacts to this and just sort of tries to reach out and and makes the time for avery which is really just what she needs and i hope i hope this sort of continues to happen and works out mm. yeah um yeah. Also, on the topic of the like the the tieflings that are uh, the Declans and and Gary and Kinley, yeah. um, could we, <laughs> the hilarity of playing statues as a game <laughs> has just clearly started as the ultimate like parenting tool for like, hey, um, whichever one of you shuts up for the longest can have an ice cream or some shit, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just evolved into like a family tradition. Yeah, I love that it worked really well on Sheridan and Rowan, and then it just yeah. obviously hasn't worked because it's ridiculous. <laughs> and of course, um, there's a moment where one of the Declans mentions that it seems lame, <laughs> and <laughs> and I I just can see um, Avery's mum being like, no, please no, please this is, <laughs> this is all I have. <laughs> uh. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it was great. Anyway, um, so yeah, uh, Avery bumps into Matthew and Edith here and they have this very awkward chat about like, hey, are we cool? Yeah. Honestly, I mean, Avery goes on and on about wanting to be in a relationship and stuff. This feels like what it's like to talk to an ex. Mm. Um, it, it's funny how like, and you, also, you sort of already touched on this, after the very grandiose and combative nature of the previous chapter slash last night, um, I was surprised at how like chill and and civil this was. Like, I, I really feel like both Avery and Matthew and Edith, when she gets to talk, um, are really cool. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and kind of sure. like you know, it's like, oh, how are you feeling? I'm very hurt by what happened. Well, so are we. Yeah, <laughs> it's just kind of like, okay, like this is a really good dialogue that's happening here. Yeah, um, there's it, still a chance. You can kind of tell that um that they kind of have to play the politics and not you know not be like ah oh, we want to try and resolve this because there's still obviously enough going on with the Kenneth others the other Kenneth others that are not pro Kenneth trio um but it, it is nice that they are you know at least being like hey like we're still allies like we still want this to work we're gonna put in the effort you know it's it's good stuff yeah yeah, and like Edith still says she'll give them lessons and stuff. Yeah. Although at, by the end of the chapter, that all might be some evil ploy. Um, <laughs> lessons in murder, she means. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. A- Avery definitely continues her read of Matthew being a bit dominating over Edith. There's just these little subtle bits of narration where it's always like Edith talk. Oh, Matthew talked over Edith, or Matthew said not really addressing Edith's comment. Um, so Avery definitely seems to still think there's something up there. Mm. Um, but Matthew does teach us about um, people who are aware. Like that is, that is our sort of term for people who know about magic and stuff, but they're not like awakened. They're not like full on practitioners. Mm. Um, and like, you know, some people do this on purpose to basically have snowdrops, um, like people who can lie, um, but not as cool, obviously, as the actual snowdrop. Um, but like, I feel, I feel like this is really good info for us to have because like, I'm sure all of us reading the story have at some sort of time thought the Kennedys sh- should let someone know about the, the magic and stuff. And uh, I mean, even the Kennedys, like Lucy thought about Booker. Um, I doubt Verona's actually really thought about doing that to anyone, but, um, mm. and now we sort of know the risks and benefits associated with that, like particularly the risks, which is that 
others and stuff will sort of gravitate towards them since they're no longer innocent. Um, and you bear like a sort of karmic responsibility. Uh, you're on the karmic hook for if anything bad happens to them. Yeah. So it seems like it's, it's a pretty risky strategy to, to bring people on. Yes. Um, now, am I being tinfoil here or is it too much of a coincidence that Matthew comes up with this right when Avery's mum is like, you know, starting to coax and uh, prod at what's going on with Avery? Is this secretly them being like, no, no, you can't talk to your parents about this? Or is that, <laughs> am I reading too much I, into it? I don't think so, but I can't conclusively say that I would rule that out. Um, I, I mean, I feel like Booker is probably the closest any Kenneteer has come to genuinely considering letting someone in, like Lucy, Lucy to Booker. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Uh <sighs> Also, Matthew tells us how divided all the Kennet others are. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, we we knew. I, I think, like, we, we all knew that, but it, yeah. it's, it's the first time we've actually sort of had one of them admit it, where it's, like, pretty much the only thing we agree on is that we like Kennet. Um, <laughs> yeah. The rest of it's a clusterfuck. Oh, poor. With having Miss, it's just, it is just a mess, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, Miss just has such a good intuition and a way of like telling people why they should do what she wants them to do and why it's better for everyone. Yeah. Um. And just without that, it's sort of, you know, everyone, everyone's just sort of defaulting to to their instincts, and it, there's no leader to sort of convince them otherwise. Mm. And there's such a diverse set of others. Like just with Fairy and Goblin alone, you're almost never going to get a u- unanimous vote, right? I mean, yeah, hundred percent, and not not least to mention that the hungry choir is theoretically a part of their voting process if they want to be. Yeah, theoretically. <laughs> um, there's a lot of messy situations going on with the management of this town. Mm. Anywho, uh, Avery leaves behind uh, Matthew and Edith and goes to to join the rest of the uh, rest of her family before bumping into a more horrifying uh, beast. Verona's dad, and he's got TV dinners. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, the most terrifying monster in the in the store, and that's including yeah. all three Declans. Fan art of monsters um, uh, due in a week, so <laughs> Verona's dad found in now. <laughs> Verona's dad loading up on TV dinners um, <laughs> is would be an iconic monster picture. Um, yeah, uh, so one little beat from this before we dive into the, the mumming and the, and the um, Verona's dad stuff. Um, yeah. There's like this little moment where Kinley, who's Carrie's friend. Yes. Um, I mean, basically she sort of says, so it, it, it seemed to me like basically Kinley might have a bit of a crush on Avery. Yeah, definitely. Kinley acts in a very adorable little kid way. Yeah. Um, which is just funny because Avery doesn't seem to clock this at all. Mm. Um, it does every register. So clearly she needs more confidence. You've got to use up a bit more glamour, I think, to <laughs> yeah, sure you get Avery more on the glamour. I'm sure that will help. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. But it's just uh, like some of that has... It, I'm now at this point with the glamour hanging over us. So I'm at this point where, where something good is happening to Avery like this. Like, like I, I would normally be like, hey, you should use... Like, this is a confidence booster, you know? Like, somebody thinks you, you seem really confident and cool. But the glamour kind of undermines that all for me now, and I'm like, oh, but anything good that's happening is just going to kind of be, like, cast on the glamour. Like, it just casts a shadow over everything kind of good that is happening to her. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The f- yeah, I don't know. And it, it makes it feel like, to me at least, that the victories she's, the minor victories she's having are, like, in some way lessened or, like, not as yeah. earned, you know, which I, I guess is unfair, but I don't know. It, it, the thing is, is they worry me because if the glamour becomes a problem, then it feels like all of them could go away. Like that's like the whole thing about glamour is it's 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 there until it's broken. Yes, right. So it it makes these things feel a bit more fragile. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. And so then, um, again, Avery's mum killing it with being a mum. Um, mm-hmm. she her her like line of questioning and and level of concern relating to all the Verona's dad bullshit uh seemed spot on to me. She she has that moment where she has to fight her instinct to become a helicopter mum. Um 
which is just on particularly it. ironic given Avery's history. Yeah. Um, like I even think there's that bit where she sort of explains like, okay, well, I don't want to smother you, but also I don't want to um, like, yeah. you know, Abandon. give you too much space because yeah. we've seen how that goes. Yeah. Um, like she's just communicating with her in a very adulty way. And that's something yeah. sort of Avery directly brings up. And that's just, he's just, you're killing it. Avery's mom. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, yeah, it's good. It's so good, right? Like, ah, oh, it's so nice having good parents. <laughs> yeah, especially, especially when they're they're being good parents by shitting on Verona's dad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, maybe we just it, it is just the fact that Ver- Verona's dad or VD exists in this story that makes this feel so refreshing. Um, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I, I'm so interested to see where all this sort of stuff goes. But yeah. uh, we, I think we have a section break there because we jump forward to Avery waiting yep. for everyone uh, on the roof of a cafe. Yeah, um, and, you know, waiting for, for uh, Verona and Lucy uh, and Snowdrop comes along. Yay, Snowdrop, back in the story. <laughs> Always a treat. Before Snowdrop shows up, there's this, like... So uh, Avery basically finally has this point where she has to sit alone with her thoughts because she's gotten there before everyone else. Mm. Um, so she has to sit still. Like, she can't keep moving. Um, there's no one around to distract her. Like, like you know, like the, the hustle and bustle of her house kind of keeps her from pondering her thoughts. Mm. Um, so she basically has to sit here and think, um, and that turns into... Basically, her realizing how desperate she still is for a, rela- a relationship. Yeah. Um, it, to the point where she's like, "Oh, that's probably what pushed Olivia away." Like, you know, she, mm. she, I was, I was too clingy. Is sort of the the point she sort of talks around, um, uh. and just thinking about how sad she is about Olivia. Um, she pictures what it would be like to go on a date and have someone to hug, and she's picturing Miss Hardy in that, which still just doesn't feel very healthy. <laughs> um, yeah, like it's just. <laughs> It's also like she gets some time alone with her thoughts, and it's just like, yeah, she's in a, a pretty dark place. Yeah. Um, oh man. Yeah. The, the the stuff with Olivia as well really hit me. Just like, oh yeah, shit. Of course, this was a very formative crush for her, and so now it's become this like horrifyingly painful thing for her to think about, and and really feeds into this isolation complex that she has. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And like, just. So, so obviously, um, like Snowdrop shows up, and I feel like Avery kind of immediately enters mum mode. Yeah. Um, which is great because she kind of emulated her own mum and, and and kicked ass uh, similarly. But it made me realize, like, as Avery's thinking all this stuff about the relationship and wanting someone to hold, but they have to be dateable. And I think she says this as she starts to hug Snowdrop. It really made me realize how much the universe has kind of monkey poured her wish for a companion by giving her snowdrop because she's gotten someone who will, you know, always be on her side and have her back. She's got that someone who hugs her, Mm. but it's not someone she could sort of be romantically with. And that seems to, at least to Avery be like at the moment, a very important part of that whole dynamic. Like she wants uh, a partner and, what what she's sort of gotten in Snowdrop is someone who's obviously great. Like we all love Snowdrop, but it's both simultaneously exactly what she does and does not need. Mm. Um, I hate saying something bad about Snowdrop, but it's only just sort of clicked for me that um, she's gotten someone in her life, but it's just not quite the f- framing she wanted for that. And it's, um, you know, I, I, it's just, it, it sucks uh, on some level that she's got Snowdrop, but she doesn't have what she really wants Mm, yeah i don't know i'm i get what you mean and i do agree that a relationship would be quite formative for avery but i'm i'm like relationships can be messy and i'm just kind of like i i'm just glad that avery has dependable people in her life and even one like obviously the trio is that and now snowdrop is that i think a few more of those and i'll be very like okay avery now you've got a good stable base of friends that you can rely on. Go off and have potentially dangerous uh, emotional experiences. I feel like <laughs> the three of these are uh, girls are in such a well, maybe Lucy a little bit less so, but even not to that large of an extent. I feel like they're in such a precarious emotional place that I'm just nervous about any 
anything that could happen to them. <laughs> yeah, like I should say, I don't think that Snowdrop is is bad for Avery or not what she actually needs, but it's not what she mm. wants, if that makes sense. Like it's sort of the the universe has kept her sort of yearning. Like it, you know, if Snowdrop had manifested as something like five years older and been like another teenager. Mm. Yeah, like it could it could just be such a very different dynamic that could kind of be giving Avery what she needs, and that's not how it went. And I, for some reason, that had only just sort of clicked for me as, as something that was actually a possibility. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, I, I'm just I'm just glad that she has support. You know, I'm not. I don't <laughs> yeah. have questions. Too Avery's much. Avery's very much in that point right now. You know, that's about it's like you've got to be okay with yourself and work on yourself before you can be in a relationship. Mm. And I, I feel like Avery's still there. Um, and and right now the problem is, is that she's working on herself with glamour, which I don't think is the right way to do this. Mm. Yeah, a hundred percent. I agree with that. <sighs> um. So yeah, the, the group uh, gather and uh, kind of a, a chit chatting about the town as they head to see Louise. Finally, we get this interview with Louise. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, I guess I'm jumping ahead a bit in the notes, but like, I've been feeling since 3.8 that we were going to have like a Zed or Bree interlude fighting the Hungry Choir. Mm. Um, and the fact that we just did the final interview has made, like, I'm I'm willing to bet the next chapter, which is the one that's probably releasing as we're recording right now, oh, yeah. um, is going to be that Hungry Choir interlude fight. Do you want me to go check and see if you're correct? I mean, sure. I'm going to see if it's out yet. It's not. Never mind. As we're recording, it's not yet released, folks. Um, yeah, but I actually, I mean, originally this was the guess I had at the end of 3.8, so I'm just kind of taking my guess and saying, but this time I, for I sure. I agree with you. Like, the <laughs> fact that it was so explicitly set up and we got, I mean, the sunny day logs are like, and here's the group we're going to put together for this fight. Exactly. Like, <laughs> it just feels like we're about to see the fight. It, it, it can't be more than a few chapters away. Yeah, well, and, and like it would make sense to me to end things, you know, not just looking at the arc's length already, but end things kind of on the final interview. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, and the revelations we get at the end of this chapter. So we'll see. Should, but should um, we d- jump to those. I mean, you know, the the Louise stuff. Uh, basically, we we retrace Louise's steps and we kind of see all of this stuff again, but with the the trio getting their their kind of perspective on it, which is yeah, good. I was, d- but just before we do, I, I had two quick things I wanted to mm. talk about from the, the the sort of the on the way to Louise where they have this sort of discussion. Because um, first of all, one of the things that comes up is that Lucy and Verona went to get uh, more more glamour. Uh, basically, you know, uh, Avery needs more more of the stuff. Um, the other two went and got it, and it, it's just like okay, so one of these girls getting addicted to glamour just feels like fairy bullshit yeah um and i'm in- intensely worried for when it's avery's turn to go and get the glamour um because i don't think anyone else has clocked on to the fact that she's kind of like you know be- becoming dependent on it and i don't think that like the fairy would necessarily need this event to happen to know they probably already know w- what's happening to her but them being her dealers and when she shows up they like drastically increase the price all of a sudden just feels you know like a trap that's almost too obvious that it'll be something worse than that Mm, yeah (sighs) i yeah who knows what it's gonna like the fact that we've got so much dodgy glamour stuff in this chapter is just it means something dodgy is gonna happen right yeah yeah i I feel i feel like this is going to be something that explodes in the next arc yeah um they also sort of recap where everyone's at um not just like the (laughs) so alpiana who wasn't involved in any of this her response has just sort of been i don't want to get involved in the politics of all this Mm. which is just i mean there's always got to be one of them doesn't there there's there's always got to be someone who stays out of the politics of the situation and of course it will be like that yeah i had a good chuckle of this yeah that was one of those yeah yeah of course uh, moments it was hilarious um yeah so yeah so they go through and we get these beats of um of the Kennet trio as they retrace these steps. And we kind of get this thing of like the things that we kind of knew about the Carmine beast and that night, but had written off as like, Oh, this is just a quirk of the night. 
are, are kind of recontextualized now through the eyes of the Kemet trio. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think like this is a really fun interview to do last mm. because it's it's our sort of first interview where it feels like the Kennedy is actually no more yes. than the person they're interviewing. Like yeah. this was always going to be the one interview where it's like, okay, this person is not above us in mm. some way in terms of knowledge and power. Mm. Um and so it's really cool that it was saved for last because that also means that they're in the highest place they've ever been. Mm. So it's like this really cool final interview where somebody who actually doesn't really have the ability to trick them um, is is actually giving them information there in the best place to use it. It's it's like this is the moment where they really felt like the fucking cool investigators as opposed to people being like taken on a ride. Yeah, um, yeah. And the other thing is, like, yes, they feel like they have all this information, but I think it's very important to note that I think if they had done this interview first, they wouldn't have got anything out of it. And it no, feels exactly. like we, were- as the audience, have like gained the knowledge that they've gained here ma- making this you know this interview is packed with revelations because we have all this context going into it yeah they were exactly right to save it to last yeah. because um like yeah we we got a bunch of good stuff out of this um and i'm just really glad it happened like that because it it allowed us to do that whereas if they'd done this first and then talked to everyone else it probably would have just been a bit of a mess yeah 100% um, also, as we as we sort of start to go into the the factoids that we learned um, in all this, because I, I assume there's going to be a lot to talk about there. I also yeah. just want to mention, like, obviously Snowdrop's ability to lie is really cool, but it seems to pale in comparison to uh, like her ability to see these ways into and out of different worlds. Like here, she's helping them get into the ruins and shit. Like it's she's got this instinct for moving between worlds, which I guess, given she was made of the paths, makes sense. Yeah. Um, but it's it's pretty cool like pretty handy yeah um it's a great example of like just a really simple way to demonstrate how far they've come you know like they can now just kind of at ease move between these i'm just going to call them parallel universes even though i know that's not what it is (laughs) um and i think that's just a really great like a really great marker of like something that they had completely no idea about you know an arc ago even right yeah well, huge, huge. So, wait, if we just start getting into the factoids, mm. uh, one of the big ones that they sort of come up and, and learn about here was that the, the murder m- sort of took place in the ruins. Like the Carmine Beast yes. is sort of coexisting in these different layers of reality. Yeah. Um, and it seems like the ruins is where it actually sort of happened. And that's obviously something they wouldn't have been able to put together if they'd done this interview even like halfway through Arc 2. Yeah. Um, definitely. Definitely. Um, I think the other part that ties into that that seems important is the fact that the Carmine Beast sustained multiple wounds even over the course of the time we saw in the in uh, the prologue, right? Um, yeah. Which we, I guess, kind of theoretically knew, but it really is kind of validated here yeah. and, and explicitly spelled out. No, no, there, it was still being attacked while Louise was following. Yeah, which I have not gone back and read the prologue since like arc one Mm -hmm. um i need to go back and see if that was actually a detail that was in it because i definitely missed it if it was yeah me too um but yeah i mean i I think the other thing is like basically there is a giant bloody trail going through the town where the carmine beast walked both in reality and particularly in the ruins and there's just this sort of sense of there's a giant blood trail going through the entire town and they've sort of missed it till now yeah that's because it's 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 always going across like one little northern part of town and it's mostly in the ruins where they haven't been that much but like even avery has that moment of if we'd just gone around the corner we would have seen this huge ass blood trail Mm. um oh well yeah (laughs) they're not detectives you know no, I don't blame them at all it's just like that that would be so frustrating like if it was me i'd be (laughs) like are you serious yeah um uh, anywho uh here's one the the full moon thing can we touch on that yes because obviously like the moon we brought up the the, the, there was moon imagery with the carmine beast and that that might relate to the hungry choir yeah but we we thought maybe it was just the moon and had something to do with violence or something but um we never thought to check whether the moon was actually meant to be full that night yeah uh and it wasn't (laughs) 
uh, yeah, so that's kind of dodgy. Um, hey, I'm just occurring. It's just occurring to me now. We had the calendar bonus material, right? Does that did yep. that show us that the moon wasn't full then? No, it doesn't go. No, back. I think that okay. that calendar started um, basically when they like awoke. Was, yeah, the, 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 I mean, you could do math to figure it out from there, but um, I, I mean, the point is that like it shouldn't have been full. The yeah. story just tells us. Yep. Um. Anyway, so yeah, again, feels dodgy, and I think more explicitly, it feels like we should be connecting that to the hungry choir now, right? Like the moon yeah. stuff is so a part of it that it just has to be the hungry choir related. Yeah, I think we we yeah last time we talked about this we sort of wrote it off as being hungry choir related, but um it seems like actually it probably is. Mm. Um, then so basically the other thing is is um the metaphor that starts to take shape as to why the Carmine beast was killed is like sort of linking it to the fur trade and this idea that they've had to kill it up and and chop it up for parts to um you know get all the value from it and they sort of link that to the idea of the the fur trade which is important because chapter 1.6 this is the homework and i yeah. said it would be relevant and it was about well, the fur trade right. as soon as i saw this <laughs> i was like oh my god it's gonna be so happy with this <laughs> um, Excellent work. I, I mean it, it's because it, i went back and reread that part um in 1.6 and and the framing of the homework is they're talking about the Canadian, like, federation, like, like becoming a nation. Um, and I was just wondering, like, so it's sort of, it was listed, like, something to do with the the fur trade of that company, the HBC company or whatever, mm. um, was that, com- that company wanting to be able to use rivers for their fur trade is what was one of the reasons for Canada to try and become federated. Yes. Um as listed in that chapter and the like so you know the other one that's listed is like an american invasion which also seems relevant to this situation and it's mm. like i'm wondering if we're meant to be drawing parallels like we've obviously used our garden and and um eat like biome metaphors for for kennett but like should we also be trying to apply maybe a metaphor of like a nation state or something mm. um like is there some way that kennett can define itself as a nation that doesn't involve being taken over by practitioners um who are the evil america in this instance who even knows <laughs> i i'm yeah i just have no idea right like again it's that kind of thing of like yeah this is going to make so much sense in two months <laughs> yeah 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 uh, anyhow but yeah um so then, yeah, the last maybe sort of factoid we sort of get is uh, Avery makes this link to the coin um, mm. and basically uses this to go right back to the awakening ritual stuff that, um, you know, we knew would come in at some point. Uh, yeah. That Edith, uh, Marisica, and the Hungry Choir were the three who left through the coin. Yes. Uh, and we're sort of tying the, the coin and its uh, fur, fur trade imagery to what's happened to the Carmine Beast. And they've. Uh, through that link, suddenly become our top three suspects. Yeah, as a sort of trio, the the anti Kenneteers. Yeah, which is because Avery thinks that this is kind of the universe signaling this link, right? Um, yeah, which yeah, I can see it. I can see it. It it was definitely a uh, a logical leap that I I would never have made. Like it was a few steps beyond me, but I can see it. Um, I, I I like this because it's a trio, and now that we know that the hungry choir is a girl at its core, it's it's the anti Kennedys. It's it's three women. Mm. Um, so you know they're they're going to have to one v one each other in the in the ultimate fight. <sighs> ah, yeah, I'm sure that'll be what it's like. <laughs> um, anyway, I mean, there's interesting parallels you could draw there. Maybe this is just me being silly because you could yeah, probably do this anyway. But, you know, like, like the symbolism. Well, like Edith and Avery, like Edith is sort of quite literally defined by her relationship to Matthew. There's there's some mm. stuff there. Okay. Um, Marisica is is the Verona. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. I mean, I've talked about how I think Verona's fairyish, uh, and then the Hungry Choir is associated with like violence, and and Lucy has been as well. All right, how about this? I keep that. Lucy is the Hungry Choir. I can do that. Marisica, yep. Avery, the link being. The, every obsessed with glamour. Okay. <laughs> and Verona is uh, Edith because they're both women that 
uh, are heavily drained by the like normal human interactions <laughs> of their lives. I uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I like that. Um, I I still are going to stick with mine. All but, right. Well, we'll um, see. We'll see when they each yeah. have their one on ones in the final arc, and they have to each take yeah, out the exactly. doppelgangers. Who's going to be here? <laughs> and the the hungry choir really just doesn't fit into there at all. That's the problem. Well, it'll be, it'll be less the hungry choir and more Yolda. Yolda. Maybe. Yeah, true. If Yolda, if we meet her and she starts to take a yeah. wait, you know, once her secrets out, maybe she'll she'll be less out of the picture. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe she'll like take a final form or whatever. Exactly. Um, so now let's move on to the bonus. I, now I'm just picturing using glamour to like Megazord yourself by combining the Kenneteers. Like they can glamour themselves <laughs> they can into like into... I don't know, like a super witch, a giant carmine beast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, is, that anything, is there anything there? I'm trying to think like. The animal masks, is it kind of like if you if you stick a fox and a deer and a cat together, you get a carmine <laughs> beast? Is that anything? I don't I don't think that's anything. Yeah, I'm try I'm trying to think like I don't think there are any um like mythological creatures, you know, like those ones that are just combos of other yeah, animals like they turn into chimeras a chimera or griffins. With a, yeah, exactly. With a fox, <laughs> a cat, deer. Um <laughs> anywho. Yeah, oh yeah, like a Cerberus style yeah. thing, but yeah, each yeah, head yeah. is their animal. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um maybe that's what the interlude will be. Something to do with that. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> from as... the yeah, the interlude from the perspective of the, <laughs> the, the Averonosi. Um so uh <laughs> in our three point nine extra material, um we basically see Zed getting into a chat room to talk to to to, to Rad Ray Sunshine. Yeah, I, and I mean, you know, you better not forget your password. <laughs> this, is, this is the craziest shit. Like, this is such a fucking cool mix of technology, magic, horror. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I loved this. The, the way it's like, it, it's taking like those old mud style games and, and like making them real. It's like, you know, you hear a man clanging downstairs and it's like, that's actually happening in real life too. Mm. Like that's, that's such a great horror idea. I'd love to see this in a visual medium where it's sort of happening in real time and, and you're realizing it alongside Zed that these things are coming into the world. Mm. Yeah. Um, it is horrifying, isn't it? It's so wild. What a wild, uh, technomancers are so fun. <laughs> They're so <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> They're very extra. They um, are. They really, really are. Wait, this idea that it's like uh, Ray got involved in this because there was a seven dwarf script that got turned into an urban legend, and then these seven dwarf, like evil others, manifested. And Ray was like, "Cool, I'm going to take those and turn them into security bots," um, which I guess gives us a bit of a glimpse at how, uh, like, Zed might want to use the hungry choir. The hungry choir, right? Like, these are the sorts of transformations they can use them for yeah he's they, they're basically going to become his version of uh you know like a a capture a, a capture thing on a website <laughs> where you have to enter your you know they they ask you enter your name and then click on all of the pictures that are pictures of cars and if you don't do it you get signed up to a murder ritual no well what would you use something that has thousands of wives for Peer-to-peer -peer network. Yes, ah, yes. Hungry choir torrents coming to you <laughs> soon. A, no, it's a messaging service where you where it's like oh, sending like hungry choir to deliver messages for you. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah. Um, I yeah. I, okay. So back on my mini list of things I love about this extra <laughs> yeah, material. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think this might be my favorite so far. Like Ooh, visually, nice. it's it's fantastic. Mm. Not just like the sort of command line, like you know, hacker terminal styling. <laughs> um, but also like the rest of it, like the way we start getting little comments from Nina off to the side was very comic-y in a way that I liked. Um, and then just like all the other like graphics where he's opening windows and, and the, the framing of like how he had to type like say, and then put what he wanted to say in, um, in, in between. Yeah. Uh, it's like quotation a marks. It's a total, like a, it's like yeah. a mud. 
basically. Oh, it's just hilarious that when he's in a conversation with Ray, he's still having to he do still it. Does it? I know. What a like stupid it's his... thing to do. <laughs> um because I, I mean i guess that's the other thing is there's this digital world that people are projecting into mm. and and like that feels big to me because we've sort of talked about oh the ruins and there's the spirit world and they were shaped by humans or, or whatever and and blah 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 um this is like a straight up artificial world that they're able to project into and mm. i mean that like feels like it could be important again i I think i already brought that this up this episode but we're talking about oh the world's changing and the spirit world's changing the fact that humans are straight up intentionally creating artificial worlds that they can project into Mm. um has got to be important yeah i think so i think so it's you're right it's all coming back to these themes of the way that these established systems are you know, being disrupted and eroded. Yeah, and, like, can others... Would others start to show up in these other worlds? Mm. Um, mm. What would they look like? Interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, like, there's, this, there's like, so much to talk about. Like that, could be, that could be a book on itself. Like, just talking about the effects of technomancers is, is enough to fill a whole story. Um, yeah, and, and I, I like this as well because it, it ties into, like, we did the extra or our own bonus bit on the techno pagans i think it was even last week Mm. and i don't know if i actually brought it up in there but one of the things that kept coming up in the interviews i was reading with techno pagans is they were talking about how they viewed um like the metaverse like the the yeah you know the online space as an analog of the spirit world and it's like oh it's a place where you know we express our ideas and you know, those people were genuinely treating it as a kind of extra spirit world thing. And we're kind of seeing that you can do that now in Pale. Like, open up one of Ray's uh, seven dwarf login things, get in, and you can astrally project into a digital world. Mm. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I mean, I yeah, we've kind of touched on the idea of, like, paths and alternate worlds and stuff. So I'm excited to see what are the techno-mancer versions of those, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, like the artificial ones of them, are they are they any different? Mm. Um, and what does that say about them? Mm. Uh, mm. Also, uh, Zed has this uh, librarian animus, um, which is, I guess is some sort of like spirit or incarnation it's, of yeah. librarians. If you're familiar with uh, the Dresden Files, it's what we call a bob, seems like. <laughs> Uh, she struck me as as a bit of a Giles from Buffy, yeah, uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting because like, I I tried to see like I, I originally wanted to try and do like a monster corner on this, um, but perhaps unsurprisingly, I couldn't come up with much. Mm. Um, the the term animus, uh, which is what you see, it's like Latin for like spirit or soul mm. um kind of the only other real sort of use of animus is uh in jungian psychology mm. uh which has actually come up in, in some of our other monster corner stuff uh, related to the alchemy stuff um it, it's used to describe part of like the collective subconscious so animus and anima are like these male and female subconscious things but i wasn't sure how that would relate to this librarian at all mm interesting yeah i uh especially because like the other little detail we get with the interaction with the animus is um is zed trans uh yes it seems to be i mean there's you know a few things that hint at it um throughout this this bonus bit Uh, there's the line that's like zed talking about how they have you know shifted their life before (laughs) uh was one that i I particularly like yeah okay cool i just i I wanted to make sure i wasn't misunderstanding that Mm -hmm. but um yeah um and then the other thing we get here is is a bunch of details on the other students and teachers at the school um which you know are people that will presumably be in the lives of the kenneteers uh soon um Mm -hmm. and also presumably will show up in the interlude we're both expecting uh soonish yeah but um yeah i mean obviously we already know chase and nicolette great people It'll be fun um, to see them again, see how Nicolette's doing. <laughs> uh, there's this, like, scrapper uh, who was diving into the ruins. Mm. Um, and then there's this, I think this is pronounced Durasher. Uh, um, yes, who knows? 
Durasher person and a bunch of their students, um, or well, two of their students, and the other one is a what was it, pretty cockroach. <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah, Durosho sounds fucking terrifying based on what Zed says, and I'm inclined to trust Zed because I've liked everything about him so far. Um, so yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's it's all in. Like they're really going nuclear with this attempt to take out the Hungry Choir. Um, the this brief look we're getting at everyone who's involved is kind of like, okay, Zed is kind of basically saying most of them are shits, um, and he doesn't like hanging out with them. Mm. So I, I, it's not painting the best picture of, of everyone, but um, I I can't wait to hopefully get to see them in action. Yeah, I I'm uh, I'm exci- I, like yeah, we've we've talked about this. I just need to see this. Like it's just going to be this <laughs> awesome showdown between a bunch of wraiths and a bunch of uh, powerful or, or semi-powerful practitioners. And we're going to get some horrifying thing where Yolda's going to manifest, and then it's going to set up this, you know, penultimate uh, arc of the story where Yolda is now back and she's angry and, you know, she's murdered Chase and some other student and the shit's going off the rails. And I'm just I'm yeah. keen for it, you know? I mean, knowing this world, it'll be one of those things where it's like Yolda was actually kind of being held down or held back the way things were currently going. And then, like, when they confront her, it'll sort of, like, you know, the attempts to bind her will actually, like, unleash her final form and she will come more to the fore or something, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. I don't, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Uh, not super clear. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I, like, basically, I'm saying, what if at the moment Yolda is actually, like, mostly asleep or something, yes, right? Like, uh, yeah. a, this is this is basically the Hungry Choir on autopilot. Yes. And the attempts to shut it down will sort will of activate and make things, uh, and, like, worse, well, basically. Yeah, I mean, is that going to be worse, though? If they, like, bring out some sentience in her, will that be... Maybe it'll be worse, but it'll also be a vulnerability if they can get John on board for some shenanigans yeah. or, yeah, who knows? Well, I mean, that's the thing. It, it could be worse because if she's been asleep this whole time and then she wakes up and it's like, hey, remember when the one person I liked and trusted shot me? Um, oh, yeah, true. I'm angry about that. Yeah, that's true. That could be bad. <laughs> she, yeah, she, she she might be angry. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess we'll see. I mean, I still don't quite know if there's going to be a Yoldery Yolder in in the mm. heart of this because she was shot like you know how much of yolder is is left i feel like she's been talked up so much that we have to see some she's going to play some part sure. in this right whether it's as the enemy or whether it's as the kind of tragic figure that's trapped inside the hungry choir yeah um uh, i'm not sure but I, there's got to be something i think that's probably right yeah um so uh i mean that's it right that's the end of, is, yeah. it, is there anything else to touch on with this bonus bit or that's the end of uh, our chapters for this week. Yeah, no, I mean, all three fantastic. I'm so psyched for whatever's next. Mm, yeah, which is going to be the Hungry Quaid. Um <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, before we wrap up, before we finish off the show, uh, let's dive into some predictions. Um, you know, people make yeah. predictions on the Pale Predictor app uh, with what they think is going to happen. And obviously, uh, I feel like we've talked about how we feel like we're starting to get to the end of the story now. Um, so a lot of questions are getting answered. I still don't feel like, you know, we read through each of the predictions that are left in the thing. We've pulled out some of our faves, but I don't think that we've got one that has been like, oh, this is it. Like, this is the answer to everything. So there's still space for somebody, I think, to be the, you know, I've solved it person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially as we get to the end, uh, what people I think will be able to do is start laying out more complete theories if that makes sense like like you know you still absolutely get tons of credit if in the middle of arc one you are like i think it's these two and Mm -hmm. and they end up being like two of the three yeah you know um but you know then somebody also gets credit if at the end of arc three they're like these three did it for this reason Mm. using the extra info like and sort of take the theory the next step you know yeah yeah um anyway should we pull out some credit uh, some theories that we really like yeah, yeah. Uh, what have you brought for us? Uh, I brought a theory from Uncle Thermoscales, who talked about this interesting beat that they noticed, which was um, in the Awakening Ritual, when Alpi goes into the circle, both Verona and Avery reach for molasses to give to her, but ultimately Avery is the one that actually gives it to her. 
And Uncle Thermos yeah. girls think this is foreshadowing that Verona and Alvary, uh, Alvary, Verona and Avery, you know, argue over Alpi, who's going to be Alpi's, what's the opposite of familiar? But master? Patron? Whatever. Um, I think it's familiar both ways, but I'm not 100% oh, okay. sure. Yeah, cool. Uh, anyway, obviously Verona and Avery have had this kind of on and off bit about it. Um, and potentially Uncle Thermos Girls thinks this is a foreshadowing that Avery is going to be the one that actually gets to be her familiar. Yeah, I, I like that. That does feel like exactly the sort of detail where when you're reading things in retrospect, you're like, oh, foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I would now tend to agree. I'd actually thought Verona and Alpi made a better pair. Um, maybe because in my heart, I want Avery to take Snowdrop. But mm. um, I I agree. I think if Alpi's going to be one of those now, like uh, I would take this as pretty good evidence for Avery being the contender. Mm. Yeah, uh, I liked it. So I wanted to pull it out. So uh, if it happens, Uncle Thermo Scales gets the credit. <laughs> um, what about you, Elliot? What have you got for us? Um, so I brought a theory from Kayleen, Kayline. Mm. It's two Ys, no I. Um, in, in, anyway, Kayleen, Kayline, uh, basically has come up with this theory. I'm just going to read it verbatim. Uh, Cherry Pop is a lot smarter than she lets on and has some sort of trick similar to Best Trash Girl. That's why she calls herself stupid, etc., yet still gets a full vote and has a say with the others. I feel like she will be the key in linking Carmine's death and the goblins while allowing her to slip under the radar as she is seen as so minor. And I don't necessarily give this like a high likelihood as a theory, but I fucking love it as an idea. Like <laughs> Cherry Pop being the secret mastermind would be a fucking like it would it would be so fantastic. It's hilarious. It would be pretty good, wouldn't it, to find out that Cherry Pop has secretly <laughs> been the Goblin Mastermind. <laughs> I don't, I just, I mean, I'm here for it if it happens, I guess, is all I'll say. Yeah. I, I Yeah, I can't see it right now, but I'm, like, happy to be <laughs> But I'm open wrong. to being convinced. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, uh, with, with those predictions covered, uh, should we move on to last week's discussion question? Mm. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so last week's discussion question was, what piece of outmoded tech would you use as a technomancer tool, and what would it do? Um, I pulled out, yeah. well, let, me, let me start with an answer that I really liked. And I think this answer really um, exemplifies the thing that I think is the most important in coming up with a technomancer piece of technology, <laughs> which is that you have to start with a pun and then think of what it would do. Because I'm sure that's how actual in in universe technomancers come up with their tricks is they start with what's a piece of old technology okay what's a pun i can make about that thing and now how can i make that somehow useful right um, the enter so things key, like because they, the they bug, all had all of that stuff right they all had such good names yeah yeah enter key the computer bug keyboard. the grungy keyboard yeah the um, jammer exactly so professor crispy has come up with the punch card which great, great old technology reference. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's like one of those, you know, those like prank uh, cans of peanuts that you open and a s snake comes out or whatever. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like that, but it's like a birthday card. And when you open it, it punches you in the face. And it's perfect. <laughs> I mean, like, it's, it's a perfect <laughs> pun and a perfect stupid thing that, that a technomancer could do. Um, I, I really, I, when I was reading this, for some reason in my head, I had it in my mind, like one of the birthday cards that like plays music when you open it as yes, well. Yes, I, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Like, it's a, like, as it's punching you in the face, it's playing like Pop Goes the Weasel yeah, or something. exactly, which is perfect. <laughs> it's so good. Um, so yeah, I really like that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I pulled out one uh, from Aperture Lemon, mm. uh, who basically talked about like having an old like game cartridge um where you know if you're playing the game or you know you turn the game on and you go to like the right town in the game uh the music causes severe psychological distress to people um and any technology with microphones start like leaking blood and, and all that and uh, the reason I like this one is I'm I'm like 99% sure this is a reference to that old like urban legend about the Lavender Town song. Like I don't know if everyone, maybe not everyone's familiar with this, but um, 
there, there was like it was like an urban legend that um there was a there was an original version of the lavender town theme song for pokemon like red and blue mm. um that was like so horrible it like caused all these kids to kill themselves mm. um and so like they had to like rewrite I, I can't remember the exact details it's been a while since i looked this up but like yeah it, it was basically like there was this you know lost old version of the lavender town song that was so creepy it like had all this supernatural shit around it in this urban legend and i feel like that's like that led some credence to this idea to me because it's like there's that urban legend that you can use to power this game cartridge now Mm, yeah it's that it's it's like the old um fuck what's the one with the legend of zelda i think it's majora's mask or ocarina of time uh the, the that terrible fight um yeah yeah it's like ben, where they had like, the... like ben something right yeah you know yeah, what i'm yeah. talking about oh. you do i know you do it's i do like yeah that. that's what the vibe that it gives me right yeah it was like a it was a it was a copy of majora's mask that had ben's yeah. name in it right, and on. started to like haunt them and shit yeah Haunted i remember that. ocarina of time no, it was Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask, okay. Because it, it, they used the terrible fate a lot. Haunted Majora's Mask. Ben Drowned is what it's called. Ben Drowned. That's it, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Great, great, like, little horror story. I, creepy pasta, is that the right yes. term? Anyway, worth reading. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, those are exactly the sort of urban legends I think Aperture Lemon's yeah. tapping into here, which, yeah. is why, which is why I like this idea, because I can sort of see in the world of Pale someone being able to or a technomancer being able to harness that urban legend in something like this yeah um i have one more that i want to pull out that i really liked which is from a user called hobo demon um basically they talk about the fact that uh the ti graphic uh, graphing calculators are basically the perfect thing for this for technomancy tool you know making uh, because they are so iconic as pieces of outdated technology um which I think is perfect. Hmm. I think it, they're the perfect base. I, they didn't come up with a good pun, which I have to take marks off of them for. Um, and they talk about the idea <laughs> of using it for augury, which I think kind of works. But I think if you find a good pun that works with the TI-81 or TI-82 kind of name, you, you're really in business as a technoman. So, so I just thought that was, I thought it was the perfect piece of outmoded technology yeah. to base a, a, a trick. I'm trying to come up with a pun. Now. I tried. I feel I, like, yeah, I couldn't come up with one either. Something to do with time, just TI and 81. Oh, yeah. If you do some time-based one and then do some, like, you know, cr- chronomancy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Hmm. Um, okay. All right, so the last answer we're going to pull out here was um, from Foxtail Lavender, uh, who basically had the idea of, like, a, a hand-cranked, uh, like, projector or something. Um, and they specified with a fairy trapped inside, although I think you could do this with a lot of other things but basically like cranking it or or turning it on um basically causes the projector to like produce all this light and it's a kind of like glamour so you could use this projector to cover things up or like you know basically broadcast false images using the projector um which i think like projectors have been around long enough to be like a pretty good candidate for for something like technomancy like they're, they're fairly universal in like schools and um like lecture halls and that sort of thing mm. Mm. yeah that is good i i like that i like the the idea of taking this kind of uh very common experience of these like specks of dust and it becomes a, a basis of a thing yeah yeah oh good ones some good ones in here man technomancy is so cool <laughs> it <laughs> really is and I, I it opens so many cool avenues of stuff do and it's all so stupid i think that's my favorite thing about it is all tech like one of the requirements for being a technomancer seems to be you don't take yourself too seriously and i'm so (laughs) well it's all like that like super like their their aesthetic is you know like it's rad ray sunshine like it's all like kind of tubular like yeah yeah exactly which is just such a fun vibe yeah well because you know they're from um like they have to use things that have the most, I guess, cultural cachet of of of, of zeitgeist energy, right? And that is just like nostalgia eighties era technology. Like the fucking Space Jam <laughs> website is probably their their equivalent of um a power source. The Space Jam website is probably a technomancer's domain. I'm pretty sure. Do you know the Space Jam? Website? Yeah. Your silence makes me think you don't know what I'm talking about. 
I know I have no idea what you're talking about. You know Space Jam, the movie Space Jam from 1996. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, they w- made a website when it came out, and that website still exists in its original form. Um, oh wow, that's so cool. If you go to spacejam.com, it's basically a oh, yeah, shrine right to old, uh, you know, to old um, to old web design. It is atrocious. I love it. Um, so yeah, if you want to uh, support our show, you can do that by heading to www. Yeah. Oh wait, sorry. Should we should we talk about our new discussion question? Oh, oh, good, good point. Yes, we should. <laughs> Got distracted by the Space Jam <laughs> website. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I thought it would be fun to to get people's uh, opinions uh, on how things are going with this next discussion question, mm. which is, how do you think the Kenneteers or the Kenner others could have handled things better? Yeah, we're seeing. So like, the- obviously, we've just sort of seen a, a yeah. fracturing in in everyone in the town. Yeah. So, um, yeah. How do you how do you reckon? Like, what could or should people have done differently? Probably focusing more on could because I think it's very easy to say, well, they should have done this, but there's maybe a reason why they didn't. So, yes. you know, what middle ground do you think there might have been? Yeah. Um, if you have an answer to that question, you can leave it in our discussion thread, which will be linked down in the episode description down below. Uh, yes, you can also find us on Twitter. It is still, as of right now, <laughs> at MediaMD Podcast. Yeah, we keep thinking um, we'll change it, and we maybe will one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're really, uh, we're really kind of othering the situation by just not doing it. I think I made that joke last week. Now that I'm saying it, <laughs> um, yeah, at MediaMD Podcast, uh, you can find my live reads there. Um, also, like episode announcements and stuff. So yep. check it out. Yeah, if you want to support uh, this show or any of the other shows, uh, you can check out with the Doof Media Network that we're a part of at doofmedia.com. You can see all the other cool shows on the Doof Media Network there. Um, a new episode of the Doofcast has just come out on Cabin Pressure, which I'm very excited to listen to. We talked about that show, what, six months ago, a year ago, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm keen to uh, to get more Cabin Pressure discussion in my life. Yeah, I ended up re-listening to the entire show for that Doofcast episode, like I was like, oh, I'm just going to re-listen to the first two or three so I can remember mm. uh, exactly what it's like for when I listen to the Doofcast episode. And then I, I listened to the, whole thing. the all four seasons. Good on you. Um, it is, it is it's, it's honestly really good. And I feel like it's the sort of thing a lot of people will, will give skip them out on yeah, um, be, because you haven't heard of it. You really should give it a chance. Um, there are podcast feeds with it. Uh, but you didn't hear that from me. Um, so <laughs> please, please give it a chance. To find out more. Yeah. Um, also, don't forget to stop by Wabo's Patreon. Mm. Patreon.com forward slash Wabo. Uh, give him some of your coin yeah. and don't murder any Carmine beasts on the way and um, you'll yeah, be a good right. person. Yeah. As long as that coin doesn't come from fur trading, just pass it on Wabo's way. Yeah. Um, all right. I mean, that's our show, folks. So thanks for tuning in. God, this was a long one. What what happened, Elliot? These chapters, <laughs> we just had a lot to say, I guess. Well, I mean, what do you mean what happened? We just talked about it for two hours. I know, but I like these chapters didn't seem crazily, you know, huge. Am I crazy? No, I, I learned about halfway through Deep Impact not to expect any correlation between how much I thought I was going to talk about yeah. a chapter and how much I ended up talking about a chapter. Yeah. Anyway, like how, how how like exciting and monumental a chapter feels doesn't seem to correlate at all is to this, how long we end up talking is this about. Our it. Longest pair of reflections episode so far. I don't know. I feel like it is. Anyway, let us know by tweeting at us, and, <laughs> and we'll, we'll see you next. We're going to make it harder for any other ones to to catch up. Uh, oh no! It looks like it looks like our second episode is the longest. Yeah. Ten minutes longer. Than We're going to have to keep this speech yeah. going for about another ten minutes to, so, to be longer. Uh, I've been watching anything else good lately, Elliot? Or uh, I've been watching season two of Umbrella Academy. I've got one episode left, but I'm enjoying it so far. Pretty good. Well, I haven't started that. I'm. Yeah. Uh, I've just been just been getting into season two of Fantasy High again. Oh yeah. Uh, a friend of mine messaged me because the the that season just ended, right? Um, or like they oh, did the the, the main it. one, Crown of Candy, just ended. Yeah. yeah. Um, they just dropped a trailer for the new side quest or something, and so a friend of mine messaged me was like, "Hey, you should really." You know, this is great. Oh, and look, it's going to have these characters from Fantasy High in it. And I was like, what? Yeah. I haven't seen the second season yet. I really need to. Um, I, I watched that trailer and I was like, I watched the episode of Fantasy High that is like set in that setting and has those characters. 
the day before that trailer right. came out. It was, it was also uncanny. Like I, I finished the, that episode with those characters and then sort of like sat down and it was like, oh, trailer for the next one. It was like Leviathan City. And it's like, what? <laughs> I, I, I just watched that. Perfect. Um, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty hyped. Yeah. Fun. New season of I'm um, Actually just aired as well, which I have to go check yes, out. Yes, need to get in on that. Get my nerd on. Has that been 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've wasted everyone's time enough. I doubt anyone's even listening to this for this way. If you're if you're listening <laughs> to this still, at me or at Ruben, yeah. even better. Just at me, the MD pod. Um, all right, <laughs> for now. Have a good time. See you next week. See ya. <laughs>